welcome. In the days when you could take your granny to the movies without first blindfolding her and providing her with earplugs in case of shock, one of my guests tonight was the star who represented Hollywood's image of sweetness and light. She was one of the big box office stars and she had her success to being the campus sweetheart. As one writer said of her, she was pretty, unassuming, uncomplicated, with a delicious husky voice and a twinkling smile. She is Miss June Allison. Now, June Allison started her career in her teens, as did another, or has another of my guests tonight, because at the age of 16, she's already an established film and television actress, seen most recently in that splendid television dramatization of A Town Like Alice. She is Archie Whiteley. My third guest is one of Australia's leading actors, who in his time to prove his versatility, has lived like a criminal, gone blind, been blown up in a minefield, learned how to give a hysterectomy to a kangaroo. He is Mr. John Hargreaves. It's all true. Mr. John Hargreaves. <laughs> Music, and as any film fan will know, one of June Allison's best remembered movie parts was Glenn Miller's wife in the Glenn Miller story. So tonight, we'll celebrate the memory of that splendid film and marvelous band with our own arrangement of some of Glenn Miller's best known hits. That's the lineup. June Allison, Archie Whiteley, John Hargreaves. Join me after the break to meet June Allison. In, in her Hollywood heyday, my first guest tonight was described as the nicest thing on two legs. She started her career in her teens as a dancer, made two reelers, and then was signed by MGM to become one of that amazing array of stars which would audiences throughout the world in the 40s and the 50s. It was said that men dreamt of her smile. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss June Allison. <laughs> That song brings back memories to me, no doubt to you as well. Oh, yes. You sang that in words and music, didn't you? Yes, I did. Mm. <laughs> I was surprised to hear it. Were you? Uh -huh. Well, you're renowned for it, you see. It's one of your trademarks. In <laughs> fact, you started life, of course, as a, in the chorus line, didn't you? Yes, I how, did. How did you get out of it? Oh, well, I, I understudied um, Betty Hutton in a show called uh, Panama Hattie. I was so lucky she got the measles. <laughs> And I went on for her for five performances. And George Abbott, who's a big Broadway producer, was um, casting a show called Best Foot Forward. And uh, it was about, you know, a bunch of kids in school. And someone told him to come down and see me. And he did, and he gave me a job. Also, gave me a part. It all started from there. Uh -huh. I was interested to read, in fact, that you were known as Gimpy Geisman when you were a child. Oh, yes. Yes. That's, I mean, that's not a bit like June Allison. <laughs> it's a terrible name, isn't it? Oh, I know. Yeah. Where did the Allison come from? Well, Allison actually is my brother's middle name. And where did Gimpy come from? Oh, Gimpy came from... Um, I had an accident when I was a little girl, and I was paralyzed for about four years. And when I started to walk, I walked with a limp. And so the kids called me Gimpy Geisman, but I didn't know you knew that. <laughs> what sort of a background did you have, in fact? What kind of a background did you come from? Was it a poor area you lived or what? Oh, very, very poor. Mm -hmm. Yes. We didn't even have... Um... Oh, this sounds like Horatio Alger. Well, we didn't even have a bathtub uh, in, our, in our apartment. And we used to have to go down to the corner and take showers and baths in... Um, in the corner shower place. The communal uh, baths. Yes. But how, how did you, therefore, from that, from that background, how did you get the ambition? How did you become stage-struck, in fact? I mean, what inspired you? Oh, Fred Astaire. Really? Yes. I used to uh, cut school to go and see Fred Astaire mm. and Ginger Rogers. Mm. And I used to brag to the kids because they called me Gimpy. I used to brag that I could dance as well as Ginger or Fred. And one day there was an ad in a newspaper, uh, a little box, uh, asking for chorus girls to come down and audition. Of course, I couldn't dance, but the kids dared me to go down, and I did. And I auditioned, and um, they have a, a way of hiring you. They, they audition a whole group of uh, kids, and then they weed you out. And I was called back the fourth time. And what you do uh, from the very beginning is 
you walk on stage and you hand somebody some music and you sing a few notes and you do a few dance steps, but I didn't have any music. And so the piano player asked me if I knew a song and I said, well, yeah, I did. And he said, what key? And I didn't even know what a key was. <laughs> I said, oh, I can sing in any key. So he played a song and I sang a few bars and I danced a few steps and they called me back and this happened four times. And the last time I went back, I started to sing and a voice way in the back of the theater said, oh, please, you've got to hire this kid because if you don't, she's going to come back and sing and I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> and who was that? That was Richard Rogers. Richard Rogers. <laughs> That's not a bad critic of a song. <laughs> yes. I love it. Uh, but did you ever get then, when you went to Hollywood, did you ever get to, to meet your hero, Mr. Astaire? Oh, I did, yes. And I was sure that when he saw me, he would say, there is my new dancing partner, <laughs> which, of course, he never said. But um, I was eventually assigned to a film with Fred, and I was so thrilled, I, I really, I couldn't sleep night. I was going to dance with my idol. And um, we rehearsed for about, oh, two weeks. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but every time he would twirl me around the floor, I'd throw up. <laughs> really. I thought, my gosh, I can't believe that I'm really that excited. Well, I found out <laughs> I was pregnant. <laughs> I didn't know. It wasn't the excitement at all. <laughs> no. Impending motherhood. Yeah. Yes. How, how old were you, in fact, when you went to Hollywood? When I first went to Hollywood, I was mm. about 13. 13. 14. And what did, they, what did they try to do with you? Because you've always had this extraordinary husky voice. I mean, did they try to alter you in any way? Oh, every way. Every way? Yes. Um, <laughs> we were all called into um, the office um, with Arthur Freed, the producer, and he said, all the kids, and he said, now tomorrow, we're going to start this film, and you're all going to be big stars. And I want you all to go home and get a lot of rest and report at 7 o'clock in the morning. Except this little blonde girl, you stay here, I want to talk to you. And I thought, gosh, they're going to give me a real big part. And so everybody left, and he said, now, I don't want you to worry, but I want you to go home and get right into bed, and I will send my doctor over. I said, okay, well, what for? <laughs> and he said, I don't want you to worry about anything. He'll, he'll cure your laryngitis overnight. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, what, what was it? It's not laryngitis, it can't be permanent laryngitis. You know? uh, no, no, it isn't laryngitis. I finally, I finally asked a doctor and he told me I had large vocal cords. <laughs> That's as simple as that. Yes. What else did they try to change? Did they try to change your, your, your features at all? Uh, well, yes. Um, I lisp, and so they um, they have a, a dentist in school and everything at MGM, and they sent me to the dentist to get my teeth fixed so I wouldn't lisp anymore, and the dentist wouldn't touch them, so they had to let that go. They couldn't fix my voice, they couldn't um, fix my teeth, and they finally said, you really don't worry about a thing. You have a beautiful smile. But don't worry about it. There's just one little thing. When you smile, we can't see your eyes. <laughs> but we have a teacher on the lots who can teach you to smile with your eyes open. <laughs> I don't believe this. <laughs> it's true. It's so amazing. And I went to her, and I was expelled after two weeks. <laughs> I went around meeting everybody saying, how do you do? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I suppose, of course, in those days, I mean, the, the days of the big studios, and MGM was the biggest, with the biggest batch of stars, they were very protective about the image, weren't they, of the, of the oh, people yes. they had there? Oh, yes. And you had this image, of course, you and Van Johnson, you were some of America's sweethearts, weren't you? Yes. What lengths did they go to with you to, to protect that image? I mean, what, did this make you go to bed early? Were you allowed to go to nightclubs or what? No, no, we weren't allowed to smoke or drink or go to nightclubs. And we, um, we were not allowed to go out with the boys who asked us to go out. They chose your, your partners for you. Really? Uh-huh. 
and they always chose Van Johnson for me or Peter Lawford. And of course, when I married Richard, I got so, so much hate mail because I didn't marry Van Johnson. Really? And so did he. <laughs> <laughs> People say, what's the matter with you? But I mean, yeah. um, but Richard there, that's Dick Powell, of course. Oh, yes. <clears throat> oh, you. Now, now, Dick Powell was, was older than you, wasn't he? Yes, he was quite a bit older. Yeah. Um, did the studios approve of this? You, Not a bit. They didn't? No, no. Uh, Papa Mayer, uh, Mr. Mayer, um, said if I married Richard, he would uh, cancel my contract or put me on suspension because um, he was much too old for me. He also was a fading star, and I was sort of coming up. And it was the first time I had ever gone against Papa Mayer's wishes. wishes. You didn't do that. But I told him he could do anything he wanted to do. I was going to marry Richard, and I, I did, but uh, I didn't have a father. And I had the audacity to go into his office and ask him if he would give me away at my wedding. <laughs> what did he say? He said, well, okay, sure. <laughs> and then after that, after Rich and I had been married for about five years, um, he used to hold me up to the new kids coming in and saying, now you should really take a lesson from June Allison because she married properly. <laughs> we'll take a break then. We'll come back in a moment to talk some more about, about uh, Richard, your husband. Oh, yes. And uh, about, well, other aspects of your career. For the moment, Julia, thank you. Back in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back. My guest is June Allison. You know, we were talking there about Hollywood and about the, the studio's attitude and the fans' attitude toward you marrying this, this older man. What about the gossip columnists? Because you lived in an era in Hollywood when they were all powerful, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. Mm. And um, there were two really powerful ones, uh, Luella Parsons and um, Hedda Hopper. Now, Luella was wonderful. I mean, she loved the industry, and she never really said anything really bad about you. She would just scold you in her column if she thought you had done or said something you shouldn't have. But Hedda was, was very destructive. She, did, she wrote things to hurt people. Like what? What did she write about you to hurt you? Well, once um, I have two children and I adopted one and my other child is a natural child and the reason I adopted my daughter was because I had been told I couldn't have children because of my accident. And um, one day, Hedda Hopper came up to our house to interview me. And my children were playing out on the lawn. And she uh, looked at and she said, June, uh, which one is your child? And I said, well, Hedda, they're both my children. She said, oh, no, no, now you know what I mean. Which, which one is yours? And I looked at it and I said, you know, I really can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and from that time on, she really would take snipes at me. I always, well, <laughs> got one on again today. I always wear a collar, <laughs> Peter Pan collar. And um, she used to put things in her collar, my butt. The reason I wore the collar was because obviously there was something very wrong with my neck. <laughs> and so I decided the next party, I would go to, I knew she was going to be there, I'd wear a low-cut <laughs> gown like everybody else. And the next, I did, and the next day in the column, she wrote, um, I saw June Allison last night at a party without her Peter Pan collar. I wonder what she's trying to prove. <laughs> oh, dear. No real bitch. Right? This is a can't win. <laughs> no, the studio bosses too were terrified of them as well, weren't they? Um... They weren't terrified, I wouldn't say terrified, but I think they tried to keep, keep peace mm. with them. How, what was their attitude toward you and, and the marriage to, to, to Dick Powell? Because as you say, you, he was an older man. What, did, they, did they have a field day at, about that? Yeah, it wasn't very nice. For a while, uh, they would always refer to me as his child bride. 
but um, after that it was fine because we were held up as one of the, you know, happiest couples in Hollywood. And we were married for 17 years. How difficult was it a place, though, to, to, to keep a marriage together? Or is it a place nowadays? I mean, it must be very difficult. It wasn't difficult for us because Richard, um, we were never in competition with each other. And he was so wise. And I, I would always ask for advice, and he always gave it to me. And we were both able, we were very fortunate, we were both able to leave the work at the studio. Yeah. And when we came home at night, it was just as normal as any, any other family. Did you ever have those marvelous Hollywood parties, though, that we read about? Well, I don't know what kinds you mean. Well, just nice, big, <laughs> lavish ones, around a pool and all that sort oh, of thing. Oh, yeah. We, we, we weren't... Um, entertainers per se we had a, one or two parties a year but they were oh, just kind of formal parties but uh, I used to like um, oh parties on Sunday afternoon picnic kind of parties and Zsa Zsa uh, she and her sister Zsa Zsa Gabor yes mm -hmm. I'm sorry um, <laughs> is there another <laughs> <laughs> is there another right. uh, she and her sister Ava would come up on Sundays, even if we didn't have a party, just, you know, to swim in the pool and have a barbecue. And the first time they came up, I was absolutely struck dumb. We were sitting around the pool and they came in with huge picture hats, long white gloves, long white trousers, and a parasol. And they got in the pool that way. Got in the pool? Yes. I thought, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And finally I said, why are you wearing those clothes? And I can't imitate Zsa Zsa's voice. But they were so smart. They really scolded me for sunbathing and getting all, you know, they said, when you get older, you'll get wrinkled and you'll have cancer of the skin. And actually, they were so smart because you look at them today they are fabulously beautiful. Yes, yes. Now let's get back to this, this marriage of yours because uh, it, it ended unhappily. He died, your, your husband, of, of cancer. Yes. He was one of those, those group of film stars uh, and, and other people too, actually, who worked on a film called The Conqueror, wasn't he? Uh, yes. And they'd made a film, in, they made that film in the Nevada desert, wasn't it? Yes, it was in Utah. And there's been talk that uh, and it was a, at an area where they'd had a, an A-bomb test, hadn't they, or something like that? Yes. Do, do you believe this theory? Because there was, who were they? Who's died of cancer that worked on oh, that film? John, John, John Wayne, Wayne um, Susan Hayward, right. Agnes Moorhead, um, a lot of the people in the crew. But nobody told uh, the company about it, and we had a lot of uh, dust storms. And they had dropped this bomb, and it was called Dirty, Dirty Harry. Yeah. But they never told anyone about it. Nobody knew about it till just about a year ago, really? or two years ago. And um, uh, during the filming, there were so many dust storms, and a lot of us wore those surgical masks. And another thing the studio did, they. Uh, Oh, trucks and trucks of the sand and the dirt they brought back to the studios in California to put them on the sound stages. Right. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, do you believe the theory then that, uh, and it is fairly unsubstantiated, uh, that, that it had something to do with the deaths of these people, including your husband? I think it's very possible. Um, I don't honestly know. I know that a lot of people, especially the... Um, the Wayne family is um, thinking of um, suing the government. I don't know. Um, I will join them, I suppose, mm. if everybody gets together. You said uh, earlier, before we talked about that, that you were, <coughs> you were one of the most uh, happy and married couples in, in Hollywood. Yes. Uh, you were after that, and you were married for 17 years. How difficult was it for you to pick up the pieces after, after your husband had died? I guess um, it was the most difficult thing 
in my entire life because Richard taught me everything I knew. Um, he was my father, he was my husband, he was my lover, he was the father of my children. And uh, I, never, I never knew anything about the business. I never knew anything about the money. I didn't even know how much I made every week because he took care of all those things. And when he went away, it was like, oh, I don't know how to explain it. It was like somebody putting me in a little boat and sending me out to sea with no motor, no oars, no sails. Um, it was dreadful. I, um, I did a very bad thing. I didn't, um, I didn't face it. I kind of hid away. You became a recluse, did you? Yes, did I you? did. How long did that last? A good eight years. Really? Yes, until I met David, my prison husband. Did you, did you literally not go out in that time at all? Did you just... I'm not a dater. I didn't like to date. I would go out, yes. But I never had any fun. And I, I, every place I went, I had been to with Richard. And I stopped making films because every time I walked on a soundstage, I had been on that soundstage with Richard. And I think people, women who become widows, should really not ever do that. Mm. You've, got to, you've got to face it mm. because you've got to go on, especially if you have children. Mm. But it's very, very difficult. Did you find at that time, um, the, the, with your children, that you became estranged from them as well because of this grief? No. You didn't? No, we were the closest family. Actually, it, I, it turned out, I think, they raised me <laughs> instead of me. You're married again now, of course, and you married somebody who, who was not in the business. You married a dentist. And oh, yes, and I, he's I, so I, lovely. Well, how does he cope with being married to a famous face, though? I don't know. He seems to be doing all right. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I met uh, David. He is my brother's best friend. And as I said before, um, I was not a dater. And I would visit my brother, and they lived up in Ventura, which is about 75 miles from Beverly Hills. And I would go up and visit them for a weekend or, oh, two weeks or whatever. And when I did, I wouldn't go out to parties with them. And if they had people in, I would, I would stay in my room. And one night they said, um, we have a friend of ours coming over for dinner and we're going to barbecue and we'd like to have you join us. He's a very nice man. And I said, no, I really don't. I don't want to have a date. And especially a blind date. I, I, I don't, please don't do that. And they said, you will really like him. He's recently divorced. And I said, oh, God, that's the worst guy. Ever. <laughs> then I don't really want to meet him. Anyway, they talked me into it. And I, I joined them for dinner. And there was David. And within three weeks, we knew we were going to be married. Oh. Isn't that nice? Yeah, it's another smashing. Yeah, it's <laughs> lovely. I like stories like that. Yeah, That's nice. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> what about, but do, do you ever watch your, your movies when they play on television? Oh, no. Don't you? No. Can't bear to look at them. No, I agree with what the studio said early. <laughs> <laughs> I see. But it, well, when a film comes on, my children sometimes like to watch it. But without thinking, I will invariably go up to the, uh, the television set and try to fix the sound. Because I don't think I sound this way. You don't? No. What do you think you sound like? I was going to say like you, but no. I don't. <laughs> yeah. well, like but, any other girl. <laughs> like any other girl, yeah. But you used to, of course, one thing I remember from you, you are a marvelous crier on, tele on, on movies, weren't you? I remember you and Margaret O'Brien crying in Little Women. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Could you cry at will? <laughs> you want me to cry? Yeah. Can you? No. Go on. Can you, though? <laughs> yes. Can you? Yes, I think we all have um, different tricks or different ways to cry in a film. I, well, Maggie and I were known as the town criers. <laughs> <laughs> and when M Maggie had a crying scene, her aunt or her mother would take her off to the side and talk to her. But my way of crying was just to stand 
on the set all, of, all by myself and just say to myself over and over and over, I will not cry. I just will not cry. And the more I said I wouldn't cry, the harder I cried. <laughs> <laughs> now that must mean something it psychologically, means something very but odd, yeah. I don't know what. We'll, we'll pick up that thought in a moment and talk a little bit more, and we'll also uh, evoke memories of the Glenn Miller Band with Brenda Christen, the Watsons, and the Mike Pajanic Big Band. All that in a moment. June, I hope you're going to take this the right way, but um, this is the first time I have met you, because I've never interviewed you, you before, and you're absolutely delightful, but uh, you seem to be slightly absent-minded. <laughs> I mean, you, you sort of, you go, you go, you go slightly off-key at times. <laughs> the eyes go a bit. I mean, are you? Oh, <laughs> I didn't think you'd notice it. <laughs> yes, I am. Are you? I get into trouble a lot, too. Like what? Well, one night, um, Richard and I were having dinner with um, Nancy and Ronnie Reagan, and Liz Taylor, Elizabeth Taylor, was just engaged to um, Eddie Fisher. And for some reason, all night long, I called her Debbie. Oh, she'd love that. <laughs> I know, and she finally said, no, don't worry about it, just call me George. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, do you always get wrong names, then? Is that the, the Always. You know? Oh, and another time. Am I boring you? No, 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 darling. No, can I? I was in a restaurant, and I was sitting in this booth, and three beautiful people came in, two men and a lady, and they sat right in the next booth. And I kept looking at the lady. I knew I knew her. And she kept looking at me, and we smiled. And finally she saw that absent look, I suppose, and she leaned over and she said, she said, Anne Margaret? And I said, oh, no, no, no. Thank you very much, but no, I'm not. <laughs> and she said, not you, me. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Absolutely. But I have the same problem with names, too. I can't remember names. What's my name? June Allison. Right. <laughs> I, I once forgot John Wayne's name, interviewing him. I couldn't think of what his name was. He's the most famous face that I could, and what is this fellow's name? I kept saying, um, you, and uh, oh, terrifying, sir. really awful. Let's talk a little bit now, just uh, before we go to this Glenn Miller thing. Um, first of all, you're, you're retired now, aren't you? Yes, yeah. uh, sort of. Uh, every once in a while, I will, I, I will do a, a movie of the week on TV, mm. or a play, I do a play. My husband is a doctor, a dentist, but um, we co-star in a play together, and he's really quite good. Really? Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, I taught him everything he knows. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> but you don't miss it. No, I don't miss it at all. I get a, a lot of scripts, um, and I really—I don't suppose I should say this, but half the time. I can't get to the end of the script. Yes. I don't like the dirty words, yes. and I don't like uh, to go to a theater and hear a lot of bad words or see a lot of graphic things. And, yeah. um, Joan Fontaine told me that she was, in fact, the only part she was offered was n nymphomaniac grandmothers. That was the only part she, she was offered. Uh, oh, my said, gosh. I would believe it. Yeah. It's well, terrible. Well, let's just have this memory then of the time when, when movies, I say you could take you anybody to the movies, particularly your granny without blindfolding her. <laughs> and I suppose one of the movies I said that you remember for is the Glenn Miller story. Do you, were you a fan of Miller's? Oh, I, I never knew him, but um, I loved his music. Mm. And I was fortunate enough to, to be able to, you know, be part of it by playing his movie wife. And even when I wasn't working, if I didn't have to work that day, I would go to the studio just to listen to the music. You would. And meet all the, all the uh, musicians, Satchmo and Gene Krupa. Yeah. They were just fabulous. All right. Well, I hope you like this arrangement. I think you will actually. For the moment, June Allison, thank you very much indeed. June Allison. <laughs> Well, 
Well, what, what Len Miller, in fact, left behind was a classic repertoire of arrangements which have proved their quality by sounding as fresh today as when they were first played. In this tribute to Len Miller, Mike Pajanic has arranged a few of, the, of his great hits for the band, Brenda Christen and the Watsons. Settle back for a journey down memory lane with our tribute to Glenn Miller. Swing with me, I wanna wing with me. Oh, I ain't true to stay. 
called the three. There's a big bad moon just waiting for me. And oh, I think it's rude to keep it straight. But I'm in the mood. I'm in the mood. I'm in the mood. Welcome back. My next guest uh, tonight started her working life at such a young age that she makes even June Allison look like a late developer. When she was 11, <laughs> she applied to a London stage school, was accepted, and then told her parents about it. Within a few months of her arrival in England, she got a part in a major television series. Here in Australia, she's been seen most recently as Annie, the simple country town girl in the highly acclaimed television dramatisation of A Town Like Alice. Her youthful success runs in her family. Her father, Brett Whiteley, is one of Australia's best-known artists, and he was the youngest artist ever to have his work hung in London's Tate Gallery. Ladies and gentlemen, Archie Whiteley. You're already a veteran at 16, as I say, already are a veteran at 16. When did you first get the, the first urge to act, do you think? How um, young were you? All my life. I was a performer all my life, but... Um, a performer all your life, Yeah, I think I used to show off a lot. Yeah. Um, there was this place in the 60s in Sydney called the Yellow House, where it was sort of a centre for artists and actors and um, poets and stuff. And there was a stage where people used to recite, and one night, I got up and told lots of jokes and, and uh, entertained a lot of people and really enjoyed it. And I think that was when I... How old were you then? Five. Five? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must have been a terrible child, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you think you might have been? Oh, no, I was, um, no. You weren't? No. What about, how do you get into the English stage school then? Because you got there, you were 11 years of age, weren't you, when you mm. got, got, got there? How did that happen? Well, I, I, was, uh, I wasn't sure what high school to go to in Sydney. I didn't know I was sort of making decisions and I... I had definitely decided then that I wanted to be an actress and I'd heard about these schools in London where they did half day acting and half day schoolwork, which sounded fantastic. And uh, so I wrote to my grandmother who lives in England and asked her to make inquiries for me. And she found that the best one was one called Italia Conti and sent me all the brochures and stuff. And I was, then I decided I'd go there and I, the um, application meant you had to audition and you had to... Um, do three pieces of drama, sing and dance, and I couldn't sing or dance. And I had four months to prepare, so I, I looked up in the telephone book for dance teachers, and just by chance I found this um, fantastic little Russian. And I went to see her, she was in Chatswood, and we had instant rapport. And for four months I danced like four hours a day from a total beginner. She got me up to like eight years of ballet. I mean, not properly, but I still could dance like a professional in the audition. And you organised all this yourself at the age of mm. 11? Yeah. <laughs> what did your parents say when you decided uh, to shoot off to England to become an actress? They said, oh, have fun. <laughs> did they? <laughs> and did you, when yeah. you got there? Oh, I loved it. Was it? Mm. What, I mean, it, it seems to me a horrific institution, the thought of a, of, a, of a school for child actors. What was it like in reality? Um, well, it wasn't horrific at all. It was very competitive. Um, uh, the, I mean, there's millions of girls who've been training all their lives, um, starting dancing at about four years, to get acting jobs. So in that sense, it was... You know, like extremely, very disciplined and very competitive. Um, I got into it straight away. I just loved every minute of it. We did. We did a half day dance, singing and acting, and then half day schoolwork. Each the schoolwork we had to really work hard at because we only had half a day. It was very hard. It was hard work. But it when you came back to us, too, of course, you went into school, didn't you, and and kept on acting at the same time. Yeah. You did things like the Young Doctors, didn't yeah. you, while you were still at school. Yes, I did. What was the reaction of classmates to this new, new actress in their midst? Um. Well, when I came back from London, I went to a very um, conservative girls' school, 
which is probably the wrong decision because um, it wasn't very well appreciated that I was an outsider from everyone else. I wasn't conforming. Um, I don't think they really appreciated it at all. And I had a bit of trouble from the classmates. <coughs> but, uh, I mean, generally, after a while, they accepted it. And then it became impossible because I, the headmistress didn't... I mean, it was an impossible situation because I was either going to be an academic or an actress. So I had to leave that school because I decided that um, I would rather be an actress. You were most recently seen. Of course, you left school again to work in a town like Alice, weren't mm. you? Um, which is the most recent thing that we've seen on, on the screens. You yeah. played in it, as I say, Annie, the simple yes. girl. We've got a little uh, uh, section here which I'd like the audience oh, yeah. to see. Yeah, um, It's uh, you talking to Helen Morse. You're pregnant and you want to get rid of the baby. Here we are coming up now. Annie? What are you doing out here? I've been feeling too good, Miss Paget. Mind if I ask you something? No, of course not. Come on in. Sit down. You don't know how to get rid of a baby? No, Annie, I don't. I'm sorry. Oh, cripes. And I don't think it's a very good idea. Especially way out here. Anything could go wrong. You need proper medical treatment. I went to see Sister Douglas. She said that's what's wrong with me. Knocked up, that's what I am. How old are you? Sixteen. Couldn't the sister help? All she did was call me a wicked girl. That don't help much. Well, I suppose I am a wicked girl, but... Well, there ain't nothing else to do in a crook place like this. And I ain't the town bike. I don't care what nobody says. Wouldn't your father understand? Like hell. All he'd do is knock me block off. You're not going to tell him, are you? No, of course not. Not if you don't want me to. No. I know there's things you can do, like eating something or riding a horse. Couldn't you marry the boy and have the baby? So now you tell which one it was. Each one would say it was the other, wouldn't they? Not bloody fair, I reckon. No. No, it's not. Have you been pregnant before in a in a play? Yes, I um I seem to have been typecast as a pregnant teenager. I've had um oh, ten babies. <laughs> ten babies to date. Uh -huh. Mad Max I had eight altogether. <laughs> Um, mm, always pregnant. What about, as a, again, going back to what June was saying earlier about the parts, the kind of parts she's offered which she disapproves of, other things in uh, scripts that you get that you disapprove of and refuse to do? Oh, I've been pretty lucky, really. I've been offered a few new parts, which I haven't done, but not, no, not really. I mean, you, you've it's turned down the nudity f for, for what reason? You don't um, approve of it or, or oh, what? Oh, it's just, um, it doesn't, it's not necessary, I think. I mean, why should you have to show your body? I don't just, not that I don't approve, I just don't want to do it. I'm, is that something you approve of? Good girl. <laughs> Good girl. <laughs> right. What about um, the, the, this lifestyle that you've had, though? I mean, you've, from a very, very early age, you've, you've led a, almost a separate life from your parents, haven't mm. you? You've sort of gone away from them. Um, what was the earliest you can remember of trying to get away? Um, well, I've always, I have always been independent of them, not financially, but um, I've always been my own person. I think the first time we were, we would travel through Ethiopia, through Africa. And we went to a place called Hara, which is a place with a, um, a wall around it. And the only hotel was outside the wall, so we couldn't stay there. And we stayed in this place. We found this place with a bed and everything and uh, moved in there. And I met these fantastic women who ran the place and, you know, really fant like the nicest people I'd ever met. And uh, they were hookers. I didn't know that. Um, and my parents stayed in a back place and I stayed with the hookers for a while. I didn't realise, my parents didn't tell me. And uh, they were fantastic, fantastic, loving, amazing women. Why, why is, have you ever been able to rationalise why you have this, this independence, this urge to, to, to lead your own separate life? 
No, not really. I just, I've been treated like an adult. I'm not an adult. I've been treated as a person all my life. You, you of course, yeah, I mean, your father being Brett Whitelin is a, a famous artist and uh, part of a very bohemian circle mm. of, of friends. Um, what's your attitude toward, toward that kind of life, that sort of bohemian life? Mm. I went through a stage of being extremely conservative and um, going against any of that any of that type, that type of life, drugs and, and sex and booze and all that sort of thing. I really retaliated a lot, but um, I appreciate what I've been through now. I still, I don't drink at all and I don't take any drugs and I smoke cigarettes, that's all. But uh, I, don't know, I never will. But apart from that, I've, I've had a fantastic life. Because of the, you, you disapproved because of the effect you saw it having on the circle yeah. of people that, yeah. that, that, that Just, you moved um, in. Just destruction, really. Very, uh, the 60s, I think, were the worst when people were really getting into it into self-destruction or self-awareness, yes. whatever you want to call it. Yes. But um, not, with not very terrific results at all. No. Of course, uh, you, you saw Janis, Janis Joplin, didn't you? I mean, she was a classic uh, yeah, casualty. Yeah, she used of, to babysit me, actually. She used to be a babysitter. Yeah, in New York. Yeah. Oh, I mean, could you, can you remember any one s uh, situation that you were in with, with this bohemian group of people that, that you really looked at and thought, that is not for me? Um, oh, a number of occasions. I've seen people take overdoses of drugs and um, things like that. I've, I've had quite a few horrific experiences which haven't damaged me. I've, in, in fact, I've learned from them. I've had a few experiences like that, yeah. Do you, because of what of this amazing life that you led, still at the age of 16, I find it very difficult to believe that you are only 16, do you find yourself kind of called upon to be the spokesperson of your generation? Yes, quite often. I used to do a regular thing on the Mike Walsh show. Yes. About once a month or, you know, once every yes. two weeks. And I used to, we used to talk about um, sex, drugs, alcohol, to, towards the younger generation. That was... Um, and what, what, what's, your, what, what's your attitude, I mean, uh, uh, being in the sports, but what's your attitude toward your generation, I should say? Well, I think people keep saying that this generation gap, um, it's hard, I think that parents of, of parents my age, of my parents' age, don't realise how difficult it is for kids to be op optimistic these days. They think it's all like it was in the 60s where you fight for love and peace, but it's almost impossible to do that anymore. Why is that, do you think? Well. I have, fr I'm not in the rat race myself, you know, I'm not out there trying to look, get a job and looking in papers and things like that, but I have friends who are, and the difficulties that they go, they go through, I mean, in Australia we're quite lucky, but it, friends in England, mm. that um, it's just, it's just incredibly difficult to find a vocation on, or to find a happiness, really, I mean, there's no money, there's no, t you can't, you have to stay with your parents for years because you can't afford to get a flat, it's so expensive. Um, whereas in the 60s, when my parents were young and the same age that my friends are, it was easy. It was opportunities were open for them to explore. I mean, it's just much harder now. I think it's hard for people to understand that. So if people of my generation say about the problems of the younger generation and try to define them, we'd be right if we put it down in the main, the problems to, to the unemployment, to the lack of hope. And that sort yeah, of thing. well, not necessarily. I mean, unemployment is a part of it, but just general atmosphere that things... Um, you know, what can happen to make things better? I mean, they can't think of something that's going to change the situation. And the music, like, was, they used to be writing about love and stuff now. Today's music is just writing about hate. Sorry, June, it's you were going to say? No, I was just agreeing. Mm. Mm. And uh, music <coughs> is a big influence, I think, on young people. Yes. And uh, there's nothing very peaceful happening at the moment. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you feel, though, that when you look back at this short life of yours, do you feel that, that perhaps you've, you've lost a childhood? I mean, that, that oh, so-called magic all. of childhood? No, not at all. You don't? No, I, I've had magical moments. Most of them have been magical. Yeah. And even though I was an independent person, I was still a child, and I still saw things through a child's eye. No, not at all, I don't think. Jim, what about you? Because you, I mean, similarly went uh, on the stage very, very early. I mean, you missed out again what most of us would accept as being the, the, the normal childhood. Do, do, do you feel that sense of loss yourself? No, I don't, um, I don't feel that because I don't think if you haven't had something, you can't possibly miss it. Mm. I mean, you never envy uh, no. when, when you saw other kids when you were coming up to working, other kids playing, you never envied that, or the sacrifice you had to make? No, I know I really did not. Okay, can I ask you, um, you mentioned uh, one or two of the experiences that you've had in, in, in this uh, 16 years you've been on this planet. Um, what's, <laughs> what's the most, um, what's the experience that you've gone through that's profoundly most affected you? 
profound. Uh, What's the lasting impression on you? About a year ago, my father's best friend was dying of cancer, and his last request was to go to Bali for a holiday. This is Joel Allenberg. Joel Allenberg, mm -hmm. yes. He was a sculptor. Yes, I Brilliant, know. genius yes, sculptor. And um, we went to Bali with him, and we saw him die quite rapidly in Bali. And his wife and his dearest friends came over to look after him. And it was three weeks of, of watching this man die, which was probably... Um, the Balinese themselves were really fantastic about it. They have an attitude to death which is completely different to a Western attitude. And that made it easier, but it also made it more profound. It was, um, it was just watching this man die and the way people react and stuff that I probably sticks out in my memory as one of the most profound things. What did it leave you with? <coughs> um, it didn't really leave me with a bad taste in my mouth. Probably if it had been in Sydney, it would have. But because we were in Bali, and because of the generosity of the Balinese people and uh, everything, it was almost a beautiful experience. They have the attitude that death leads you on to a better path. I mean, it's almost a good thing to happen. And, I mean, it was, a, it was a magical experience in a way. I mean, I'm sad that he's dead because he was a really fantastic man. But um, I'm just thinking about what he's doing now. How are you going to bring your own ch uh, children up when you have them? Uh, probably the same way I was brought up. Well, they turn out to be as remarkable as you will be all right. Archie Whiteley, thank you very much <laughs> thank indeed. You. Archie Whiteley. Well, <laughs> we're back in a moment to meet John Hargreaves. See you in a moment after this break. My next guest has lived like a criminal, gone blind, been blown up in minefields, learned to give a hysterectomy to a kangaroo, and is now practicing his southern drawl all in the name of art. He's one of Australia's leading actors, best known for his roles in Don's Party, The Removalist, The Odd Angry Shot, Long Weekend, and as a country vet in the television series Young Ramsey. He's been described as a truer image of the young Australian of today than Chips Rafferty ever was of the Australian of yesterday. Last year he won a Logie and Sammy Awards as best actor in a television role and holds the dubious honour in Spain as the best horror actor in the world. He's just <laughs> finished a new film called Hoodwink in which he plays a criminal who pretends to be blind. Here he is being taught Braille. Right, here we go. You all right then, Mark? Yeah, fine. 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 Right, look, now I'll just show you this, how this works. Now, if you just put your left hand on the table... Okay. Now, Martin, I want to demonstrate the Braille cell on your first two fingers of your left hand there, right? And in the knuckles, these are the dots. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, that's the Braille cell, right, Martin? Right. Now, I want you to get used to me touching your hand. I know a lot of blokes don't like their hands being touched. But um, are, you, are you married, Martin? No. Ladies and gentlemen, John Hardwiggs. Did you, in fact, you actually learn Braille properly? Yes. You well, did. I can't read Braille uh, super efficiently, but um, the Blind Society sent uh, an instructor out to, to teach me Braille so that I could look as if I'm proficient at it. How difficult is it? Very difficult, actually. Very, very difficult. It requires a great deal of concentration. What about this, this business that you have, of, of whatever part you do, of actually get, doing research into it and, and becoming it? Um, in this part, you play the part of a man who pretends to be blind. Did you carry your research into the streets? I mean, did you pretend to be blind yourself? Yeah, yeah, I found that very useful. For what? For people's reactions yes. to, uh, to me when I was blind. I um, had a white stick, one of those collapsible things that you can do tricks with. And uh, I defocus or unfocus my eyes so that I look blind. How do you do that? Um, there's two ways. You can <clears throat> focus on infinity, yes. which tends to make you go to sleep. So it's not very good for like dramatic scenes. Or you can focus on something very close like that and you're blind. I'm, I'm seeing you, but I'm, you're just a blur at the moment. That's... And you'd go into a pub and say, stand at the bar and say, um, Midi of New, please. And the barmaid would come up and she'd 
Look at Chitsa. Pour the beer. And then she'd realize you were blind. You'd see her going, he's blind. Sometimes they'd even go. <laughs> <laughs> and then when, when she realized that you couldn't see her, she'd have a really good look. <laughs> you know, pouring the beer. And the beer had come on the, the counter. Well, you wouldn't know, and I would. I was pretending not to know where it was. So I'd be there. Could you tell me where the beer is, please? Uh, yes, it's in front of you. <laughs> uh, the other way. Shouting at you. She, yes. Because she, th she thought you're deaf too. <laughs> <laughs> they should say, sometimes you'd say, um, well, I'm not deaf. I'm, oh, um, I'm sorry. So, and then she'd get your hand and move it to the glass, maybe. But people were quite shy. They became quite shy and found it very hard to look at you, which it's was interesting. An extraordinary insight, isn't it, into the way people behave to people who are, are, are uh, handicapped. Yeah. There's a guy on television, if you've seen it here, it's a very good ad that they do. It's an appeal. It's a blind man comes on with his dog. And he says to camera, he said, you know, you, you don't treat me like a normal human being. He said, they'll speak to the dog, and not to me. He said, I'll get in a lift, and they'll say, well, that's a lovely dog. And they say, well, I'm not bad looking myself. <laughs> you know, it's as if they're not there. Yeah. It, is, it is quite extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. Some people will be very helpful and <clears throat> help you across traffic lights and, and things like that, tell you where the curb was and so on. Yes. But um, mainly people sort of didn't really want to know, which was interesting. Yes. Sad. Now, this, of course, is a true story, isn't it? The, 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 the movie. It's based, based on a true, on a true story. story. About yeah. a guy who pretends to be blind yeah. to get out of a, a prison sentence. Yeah, he, he has the idea that he'll get sympathy, you know, from the judge and a lighter sentence. But uh, by the time his trial comes up, he gets an even better idea because he's learning Braille. And uh, he dismisses his barrister. This really did happen. He dismissed his barrister on the first day and insisted on defending himself, which he has every right to do. Oh, and um, but they thought this was odd. And then, after a few hours of consultation, they realised that everything would have to be transcribed into Braille. Mm. And he would have to read it. And then it would have to be transcribed back into English. And it would take three years and, and cost millions of dollars, you oh, see, to do this dear. for this petty criminal. And it'd be a big sort of cause celeb, big scandal. So they did a deal with him and said, if you agree to be tried conventionally, um, we'll forget about the other 12 counts and just try you for one. So he got three years instead of life. <laughs> <laughs> but then he had to keep up the blind act, you see, for the three years in jail. Oh. And that's where he, he eventually became undone, because mm. he fell in love. Did you meet the man? Uh -huh. Yes, I did. Did you? Yes, yeah. Not before I did the film. <coughs> I played real people before, yes. and, and I found it useful to, to meet them before the film. But um, I didn't want to meet him because the character that we have in the movie is not really him. It's just based on it's the story. It's based on the incident, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the character is quite different. Yes. And I was glad I, I hadn't met him before the film because he was an extremely forceful, sort of charismatic person. And he did influence it, even though I met him about five-eighths of the way through the movie. For about a week, he influenced the character, just that brief meeting. Really? Exploring this thing of the technique of, of, of acting, though, as you see it, um, I mean, it, it, it seems to be you can take to absurd situations. Do you, for instance, get drunk to play a drunk? I did once. You did? Yes. Uh, it was when we were filming uh, Don's Party, and uh, I the last sort of half hour of the movie, I'm drunk in it. And I have a lot to do drunk. And I was never very good at playing drunk. It's a very hard thing to do. And um, so I said to the director, Bruce Beresford, would he mind, we had a rehearsal week. I said, would he mind one afternoon if I really did get drunk at lunchtime and, um, and see how it went? I might, it might be a good thing. So I did, I drank triple Bloody Marys and, and red wine and beer and all sorts of things. Took a bottle of vodka back to the secret room. The first half an hour, which is the half hour I remember of the afternoon, <laughs> <laughs> this experiment um, <clears throat> seemed to be all right. It seemed to be working. But then apparently, I don't remember the rest, but apparently I became a raving monster. And um, also very bad in the scenes, because the scene stretched, stretched. And I thought I was terrific, apparently, you know. Everybody's standing around going, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> let him off. 
And finally, the director said, get, get, get him out, get him off, get, send him home, there's nothing we can do with him. Put him in a cab, well, they put me in a cab. But apparently, every time they put me in a cab, which has happened about three or four times, I told the cab driver to turn around and take me back. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they'd be the sort of halfway drunk. into the next scene when this hideous drunk would turn up again and say, all right, all right, <laughs> let me do it, let me do it. I'm all right, I'm fine now. And eventually, apparently, I was pre prevailed upon and sent home to bed. <laughs> what about when you were a, a vet in, in Young Ramsey? I mean, did you, did you take advice on that? Yes, I had a tame vet you who I'd, I'd ring up, yeah. I wish I could say his name was Dr. Wild Goose, but he wasn't. He, there's, a, there's a vet in Sydney called Dr. Wild Goose. Isn't that a great name? Oh, <laughs> What's that vet? got to do with anything? Nothing. No. Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> no. He's no. an upset man as you are. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. But what was it like doing that series? Because I remember uh, seeing the All Creatures Great and Small series in Britain, and that guy, Christopher Timothy, I think it was the actor there. Mm. I mean, he actually did extraordinary things with animals. You know? he, yeah, yeah. he went through the entire routine. Did you do all that? Yeah, it's pretty tacky. Yeah. Was it tacky? Mm. What was the tackiest? Well, we had a lot of wild animals in the show because of, you know, all that cute Australian fauna sold well overseas. So we had the obligatory wombat and a koala and a kangaroo and an echidna and all those things in every episode. And when, when you bring them into a studio and they see all those lights and this big stainless steel operating table, they think it's a dunny, <laughs> you see? <laughs> they think it's a toilet. This big oh. stainless steel. It's an Australian. It's an Australian. It's, yes, we have to translate for our American guests. Dunny is a toilet. Thank you. It's all right. Just well, ask me if you want to know anything else. <laughs> and the first thing they do is sort of use it. And I don't know how a wombat could possibly do it, but I think a wombat really is just a great big bladder. Is it? Yeah. I think there's nothing inside except a bladder, you know, because they can do it for about 10 minutes. <laughs> they can pee continually for 10 minutes. Really? Yeah. Now, every time it happened, you'd sort of get it up on the operating table and they'd say, right, rehearse this. You'd rehearse it. Shoot. As soon as the camera's rolled, off it'd go. <laughs> so cut. Excuse me, um, it's doing it again. <laughs> they'd say, why don't you cut? Well, it's everywhere. It's all over me. It's terrible. <laughs> but it's, we've, we've, we've just framed out. We're cutting you here. We're only seeing the wombat's head. <laughs> and you, I mean, don't worry about it. Keep doing it. <laughs> don't worry so about you, it. Yeah, yeah. Every, every week. What about, what about the other animals, like kangaroos? Because are, are, are they quite nasty kangaroos? Mm. They can be. They're very really? dangerous, yeah. A bull kangaroo. I didn't know this until this happened to me. But a bull kangaroo um, comes into season like a, like a female. And we had a, a situation where I had to give it an injection. And um, this supposedly tame or quiet bull kangaroo was there, huge, one of those great big fellas, you know, big, sort of seven foot tall, big red kangaroo. I looked and I thought, oh God, you know, okay, it's, it's all right, is it? And they said, yes, yes, fine. Because they'll do anything. I mean, they, <laughs> you know, they'll do anything tell as you, long as they get a good shot. They'll tell you, you know. terrible yeah. lies. Yeah. yeah, they do, don't they? <laughs> it's safe, perfectly safe. And you, you, know, you know, you know it's not. You know, <laughs> you know they haven't even found out. You know, <laughs> but yeah, it's safe. So I went up to it and um, I said, "Well, how do I? Wh where do I jab it? Well, jab it in the shoulder. In the shoulder. Right. Look as if you're jabbing it in the shoulder." So I'm up to it. Well, I got up near it and it grabbed hold of me, you see, like that. And the, you know that boxing thing they that's do. Right. Well, that's that's to grab hold of you. And um, it looked terrific. They all sort of fell about laughing, and it was a mute shot, so people were talking to me over it and the director saying wonderful wonderful keep it up just it's fantastic and this thing was grabbing hold of me sitting back on its tail and they have big feet with great long nails that are like sort of daggers coming out of their toes and it was trying to disembowel me well I didn't know this at the time I thought it was being cute <laughs> you know, and, um, I, didn't, I don't know what I thought I was it was in season I'm not sure what I, <laughs> what I, what I thought I was but uh, <laughs> I thought, oh, this is funny. This will look terrific. So I'm dancing around with it. And they're saying, keep it moving. Keep it moving. Keep moving around. Fine. Let's see your head. Let's see its head. And all that. So I'm obliging for about five minutes. And not succeeding in getting the needle in. But that was fine because it looked funny. And it would be a comedy sequence. Well, the farmer came out, whose farm we were on, and saw what was going on and screamed out and said, get that animal away from him. And all his family came out, and like sort of toreros in a bullring, they lured it away with me, shaking their clothes and all that sort of thing. 
took it away. The farmer said, you're very lucky. I mean, that, that, you know what it was trying to do to you? He said, make love. I don't, I don't know. He said, no, it was trying to disembowel you. And that's, that's, that's how they do it. They that's really how when they fight, normally, they, they, dis, they, they disembowel their opponent. That's yeah, the yeah, they, they, they sit that's back true. on their tail and the, um, the, the feet, the daggers in the feet come up and up like that, oh. right into your stomach. Yeah. Now, you see, a very instructive program is for you. You know, <laughs> kangaroos disembowel their opponents and you know where a dunny is, right? <laughs> so, you, I've told you where a dunny is. A dunny is a toilet. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I'll, I'll have a rest for a moment. We'll come back to talk to, to John in a moment. All right, we'll be back after this break. <laughs> Welcome back. My guest, you and Alison Mark Whiteley and John Hargreaves. We're going to another messy conversation there about animals' habits. You, have you worked with, with animals, June? Yes. I did, I did a film. I played the um, daughter of a zookeeper. And we had all the animals on the set, lions, tigers, anything. And one day, we kept them, you know, in a, a behind these big cages. And a lion got loose one day and was walking right toward me. And the trainer said, June, don't move. He won't touch you. I'm like, of course, I couldn't move. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. He came right up to me, but the trainer got him away. Uh. What? You really don't know what they're going to do. What, what about you, Aki? Have you had any creature... Have you got a creature story for me? Um, I've just come back from Fiji. I've just been on a holiday. And I saw this... I was in the water. I saw this beautiful, colourful snake sort of slithering around, right near me, like about that far away. And I was just about to touch it, and this Fijian said, Oh, bula, bula, don't touch it! So I ran out. He said, keep, run out of the water. I got out and um, sort of came after me, but I was quick enough. And, one bite and you're dead in five minutes. <laughs> I'm going to Fiji tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. Yeah. Touch the colourful snakes. That's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> now, you've just come back from... Your, you've uh, opened this week, in fact, this very week in um, Tennessee Williams' Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, uh -huh. uh, which, of course, is set in the deep south of America. Mm -hmm. Going back to this theme of, of your researchers, did, in fact, you go to America to pick up the, the accent? Yeah. Yeah, I went down to um, mm. um, the deep south. And uh, to, to listen to the accent. And actually, it was very funny. I had on my ticket was Charleston, South Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, and then New Orleans. Well, I got on this plane in um, Never Fly Piedmont Airlines. No, Piedmont, Piedmont Airlines. <laughs> I got on this plane in New York and I got off at this airport, Charleston, and um, went into the city. And it was this ratty looking city. And I'd always heard that Charleston was the Paris of the South. You know, it's really famous for being very right. beautiful. Elegant. Yeah. Elegant and so on. And this tacky, ugly city, or bit of a city that I seemed to be in. And they, there was no hotel. I had to stay at a Holiday Inn. And <laughs> I really hate those motels, you know. So I'm booking in. And I said, um, do you have a map of the city to the woman? And she didn't really understand me. I had to say it about four times. And, then she, and her accent was so weird and twangy, I thought, if I, if I, if I copy this accent, I know, nobody's ever going to understand me. And um, finally I got through to her and she said, well, no, we don't have that. I said, well, could you tell me how far we are, like, here? Can I walk to the, um, the seaboard? The what? You said, I said, the... the oh, because Americans use different expressions. I thought, they don't use seaboard, they use something else. I said, well... Yeah, well, the, the um, coast, the um, famous old Charleston, South Carolina boardwalk. And she looked at me and said, Hey, you think you in Charleston, South Carolina? And I said, Mmm, <laughs> yes. And she said, No, honey, you in Charleston, West Virginia. <laughs> it's, about, it's way up in the hills. I mean, it's way up in the Beverly Hillbillies sort of country, isn't it? Yeah. So I, I had to stay there. there. I just had to stay there, oh, you know, because my ticket, I had one of those tickets that you couldn't change. Oh, and I had to stay there for a couple of days in this hideous place. It must be. <laughs> but that deep south, I mean, it's a separate country almost, isn't it, in America? I mean, it's not... I mean, how different did you find it? It's... Well, I mean, they still talk about the war down there. They're very... They still feel very deeply about losing the war. And they keep talking about the war. And I thought they meant like the Vietnam War, which still have, you know. No, it's the 1856 job. That's what they really do. And I thought, oh, they're joking. But no, they're very sore about it. Uh, 
Um, what, what kind of accent in the end? You said you couldn't copy that accent. What kind of... Who was the, the person who put you on the right track with the accent? Um, a, a woman writer in, um, in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, named yeah. Margaret Ann Barnes, and she'd written a novel called Martin Carter County. Called what? Martin Carter County. <laughs> Come on, you can help me here. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody understands me in Cat in the Hot Tin Roof. You don't. <laughs> um, it's, it's murder in Coweta County. Oh, murder in Coweta oh, County. Is yeah. that yeah. what you, you didn't know said? that, did you? Murder in Coweta County. So, and she was terrific. I mean, she was I writing don't a screenplay. So. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I got the wrong one? You got the wrong teacher. <laughs> well, I was just tough. That's the only one I got. <laughs> So what did you, when, you, when you tried out your accent on your director here, what was his attitude? What did he say? First day of rehearsal, <laughs> everybody's sort of struggling with different sort of American accents, you know, and trying out their accent. And I thought, this is terrific. I know it. I know it. I'll show them all, you know. <laughs> At the end of the day, Richard, where the director said, fine, um, fine. John, <clears throat> the accent's very interesting. It sounds wonderful. Can't understand a word. <laughs> Not a word. So I had to pull it back yeah. from that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's in the modified version then at <laughs> present. Then, all right. yeah. Well, all the best with that and, and all the best with, uh, with your movie too. I hope it does. They both do very, very well indeed. And for the moment, John Hargreaves, thank you very much indeed. John Hargreaves. Thank you. <laughs> right, we'll be back in a moment to wrap up the show. See you after this break. Right, that's sadly all we've got time for. My thanks to June Allison. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your stay in Australia, madam. Oh, you're I very love welcome it. here, and we hope you come back again. Thank to Archie Whiteley, all the best. Good luck to you in the future. Although I doubt if you need good luck, knowing you, kid. <laughs> and uh, John Hargreaves, all the best. I say with the play and the film. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my thanks also too to Henry Crawford and Channel Seven for the clip from a town like Alice. Next week, my guests are the one and only Mr. Kenneth Williams, John English, Marcia Hines, and Jack Absalom. Until then, from all of us here. Good night. Very good night.